Chris Vila Beck in the Rabbi from Another Planet. Please like, share, and subscribe, and ring that little bell. Ring the little bell so you're notified when new videos drop. So this is something I am very excited for. It's starting in a minute. This introduction is very short. Like, share, subscribe, comment. That's basically what I'm here to say. Like, share, subscribe, comment. And there's a few disclaimers, actually, I am, I'm here to say. This technology is blowing my freaking mind, right? What we can do now is, like, let's be clear. You can make your own audio drama on your own. With, with, with a, if you can do the music and you can write, you can do it on your own now. You do not need actors, which is mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, it also, uh, uh, um, yeah, I think there's going to be an explosion of uh, creativity. I just think the way the, the way we're going to experience media is going to be so completely different. I mean, I, I this, I've been saying this a lot. The technology is absolutely here that that you that somebody can make a a sweet they called like Saturday morning cartoons. And you can make cartoons. You could they, they would have, you could have backgrounds built in, like inbuilt that you could use, or you could put in your own custom ones. You have pre-made characters, or you can make uh, make your own characters. You can position the technology is all there to do it. You could do something absolutely comparable of any Saturday morning cartoon. You can make your own real Ghostbusters. You can do whatever. You probably do it to a higher level. The animation will probably be better than the filmation Star Trek. You, you the, absolutely, the technology is there now. And again, you don't need actors at this point, right? How far are we out for being able to realistically render photo realistic images a uh, uh, film that is indistinguishable, indistinguishable, indistinguishable from reality, right? It sounds crazy, but it's not. I mean, look at Back to the Future. Back to the Future, you had uh, from 1985, you had Michael J. Fox go back to Christopher Lloyd, and, and he's like, uh, uh, he sees this big, bulky 1985 video camera, which we all had, we all loved them. We're like, oh, look how great these things are, right? Uh, uh, and he's like, oh my God, you've got a whole television studio in one box. Impossible. That I think that's coming, and I think when that comes, it, we, we're going to get real, just meritocracy, a complete meritocracy. I don't know how much copyright laws are going to survive it, right? Frankly, and even if they do, how hard is it to make your own version, right? It, it's uh, yeah, it's something interesting happening with the D DCU. They're, they're bringing in the the uh, 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 authority, which I, you can sit right over there, and there there is Warren Ellis, the the uh, authority. The main characters in the authority are uh, basically riffs on Batman and Superman, right? That's essentially who they are. They're just a little bit different. We can create our own stuff. We can make our own Flash Gordon. We'll call it Dash Diesel, whatever, right? Right? You can, you, you, you can make your own things, right? And, that, and that's where I think this technology is taking us. Great example, right? Uh, go on YouTube and look up Dr. Alex. Do I have that book here, Harry? Yeah. Dr. Alex uh, has written uh, two of these books. This is season 13, right? He also done season 12. Uh, the, the, it's an alternate. Um, it's alternate to the Jodie Whittaker era of Doctor Who, basically you get conti continuing capability, uh, taking a uh, uh, picking up right from when Twice Upon a Time ended, right? So it deals with that whole regeneration, and it does so, I think, in quite a good way. But here's the thing: he's just put out the first chapter of that as read by an AI, Peter Capaldi, and I listened to it yesterday. And I've listened to it before, and I've read it, and I've liked it. I think his characterization is very good, right? His, his dialogue is excellent. He really nails the characters. And having Peter Capaldi, an AI, Peter Capaldi read it, just makes it sound legitimate, makes it sound real, makes it sound like I'm more interested. So, which, which, is, which is basically what brought me here. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be listening to it. We're not going to do the, the full chapter. If you want the full chapter, go to my Substack. Go to the video notes. I have an email newsletter called Substack, right, uh, which is uh, where this is going to be distributed from. It's free. It's free. Uh, uh, you're going to be getting hearing a AI version of Paul McGann read the dying days. I love this is the first Eighth Doctor uh, novel uh, produced. It was the last of the uh, Virgin New uh, Virgin New Adventure range, which I love and I adore. And it breaks my heart that this is a era of Doctor Who that is vanishing before our eyes, right? Because they're out of print and people don't remember them. This they're fantastic. You're going to hit. This is a great, you know, a great little book. It takes about two or three minutes before it really tunes into his voice, right? It it starts off, you're like, oh, that's Paul McGann, then it goes off and it goes on. It takes about three minutes before he goes, oh, now, now it sounds like Paul McGann. So Paul McGann is going to be reading this. May I suggest to uh, um, uh, artists out there, like actors and artists out there, can you give us a way for fans like us to do these non-profit things that license your voice? I think you own your voice. This is a whole new area of law. In my, and I'm not a lawyer, Right, but in my opinion, I think you own your voice, even if it's a synthesized version of your voice. Right, um, 
let fans license it so we can do stuff like this. I, I will pay you, right? Better still. Big finish. Wait, why am I doing a, the, this Paul McGann novel, not doing the uh, uh, the Sylvester McCoy uh, uh, New Adventures? Because I love those things, right? Because I don't have enough voice samples of Sylvester McCoy to be able to uh, produce an AI, AI voice of him yet. I mean, I might go through all his episodes and just like take out all the dialogue with, without any music behind it so I could do that. I, I might do that because I really, I really want to have that. Big Finish has hours and hours of his dialogue with no music behind it at all. Why doesn't Big Finish produce an AI version of, uh, of Sylvester McCoy reading Long Barrow, for example, right? Uh, uh, charge like 10 bucks for it. So it's like nominal, something cheap. Uh, and uh, that way they make money. I get the audio book that I want and, and, and Sylvester McCoy gets paid. I think that's fair. I think that works out so it's fair for everyone. That's not yeah, and they get cheap content, and they can make it in a way that I think much more more economical. Also, you know, the actors are getting older. I would be fine with an AI Sylvester McCoy in an audio interview after he passed. He should live many years, right? He should be healthy and live many years. But I'll be fine with it. I will be totally fine with it because this stuff just freaking works. Right? That's the bottom line. It just freaking works. So anyway, like, share, subscribe, comment. Go to my subject, si sign up. So again, I'm going to put out a chapter a week. Because it costs about 20 bucks to do about two hours. So if you sign, I have a paid tier on Substack. If you sign up for that, I'll put the money directly into this. I would like to do four chapters a week. Right now I'm doing four chapters a month, right? If I have 20 subscribers, no problem, right? I'll do, I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for me more than anybody else. So, okay, so, so this week is uh, Dying Day. So the first chapter of Dying Day. And it's great. I had so much fun listening to it. Uh, next week is Colin Baker, whose voice I actually think works a little bit better, uh, is going to be reading the excellent first chapter of Millennial Rights. I love this book. I really love this book. And it, it, it's, it's tragic that it's out print. Then uh, after that, I think I'll have Peter Capaldi read uh, 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 War, War of the Worlds. And we'll, we'll, we'll just go on from there. So, and again, uh, uh, no copyright infringement is intended. And please put out commercial version of these. I will buy them, right? I will absolutely buy them. If you're a, if you're a, vo if you're a voice actor... Let me license you, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, use of your voice. And, and also, make it a realistic cost. So, you know, we, what, what's going on right now is we are in a technological shift. In the 50s, televisions became commonplace and cinemas and movie studios were terrified, right? They had a big campaign against TV about how, how what a terrible experience it is compared to going, go, going to the movies. Eventually, it worked out. They can make their own <laughs> the, the television shows for them, right? Uh, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, Napster where, with, with, with people could uh, illegally download music. Then uh, iTunes came up with the right pricing. And that's the, that's the important thing. iTunes came up with the right pricing to be to make it to people that I don't want to steal. Most people just don't want to steal, right? They came up with the right pricing as a dollar a, a song. Fine, I'll pay for it. Ten bucks for an album, and the record companies were gouging us upon gouging us, right? So a fair price, a fair price. Most people would pay it, especially for the, again these fan projects are not for pro, uh, project uh, profit for uh, uh, projects. So anyway, let me know what you, really comment. Let me know what you think. This stuff is freaking incredible. I think it's incredible. Like, share, subscribe, comment. Uh, uh, the, uh, sign up my Substack. Absolutely. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on. It's all in the video. Twitter, uh, Instagram, Instagram. I'm, I'm not really uh, doing so much anymore. Uh, and uh, Facebook. Follow me on all those things. That we fan dabby double those. Now let's hand. I was going to say now let's hand over to Paul McGann. Reading The Dying Days. Doctor Who, The New Adventures, The Dying Days. Written by Lance Parkin. Read by an AI Paul McGann. No copyright infringement is intended. Chapter 1. What we saw from the ruined house. Tuesday, May 6th, 1997. The doctor was late, as usual. Professor Bernice Summerfield wouldn't mind, but he was a time lord. Not only did this mean that he could travel freely in the fourth and fifth dimensions of time and space, so he ought to be able to keep his appointments. It meant that he could always have popped back afterwards and left her a note, saying he was going to have been late. He really had no excuse. She resolved not to get too upset, and poured herself another cup of coffee. There were worse places to be than the Kent countryside in the dying days of the 20th century. Kadiatu and Amixitsa had dropped her off at the doctor's house on Allen Road a week ago, on the morning of April the 30th, 1997, the day before she and the doctor had arranged to meet. 
Cadia too had told Benny that they couldn't stay long without violating the non-aggression treaty between the people and the Time Lords. Benny and Cardia too had used what time they had to drive down to Adisham to stock up on provisions. Amixitzer stayed behind to keep an eye out for the doctor, just in case he turned up early. The locals were used to them now. They didn't turn heads at Mrs. Darling's little corner shop, even when they tried to pay for a trolley full of food with a single five-pound coin. Kadiatu had never been the easiest of people to strike up a conversation with, but this time she had been more taciturn than normal. She and Amixitsa stowed away the provisions in virtual silence, and soon after that, their time machine vanished from the gravel driveway in a burst of colour and light that Benny's human vocabulary couldn't even begin to describe. Once, she'd probably have envied them as they flew off into the unknown for another new adventure, but now she was quite content to spend a day on her own, sitting in the overgrown garden of the doctor's house, watching the birds chase each other around the treetops. On that first morning, she'd mopped down the wrought iron garden furniture, and brought out a couple of faded cushions from the living room sofa. She'd arranged them along the south side of the house, the one with the best view of the grounds. She'd put up a garden umbrella, and then settled down to a day of serious relaxation. First, she had caught up with her diary. This was more important than ever, now that she'd finally persuaded a publishing company that there was a market for her memoirs. They'd paid her quite a big advance for the rights, so it only seemed fair that she should get around to sending them something. She only wrote 800 words, none of them particularly enthralling ones, but managed to avoid thinking about Jason all day. Mid-afternoon, she did catch herself congratulating herself that she hadn't been thinking about him, but concluded after some soul-searching that that didn't count. When the doctor hadn't turned up as arranged the next morning, Benny decided to spend a couple of weeks here in Allen Road before trying to get a lift anywhere else. She had quickly settled into a routine. At half seven, she'd shuffle across to the other side of the double bed in the main guest bedroom and then shake herself awake when she realised that her husband wasn't there. Every night for 33 years, with only about a dozen exceptions before she was married, she'd slept in a single bed by herself. So why did she feel so lonely every morning now when she woke up, and there was no one lying alongside her? She toyed with the third finger of her left hand. For thirty-three years she'd not worn a ring on that or any other finger. Why did she now miss the weight of one that she'd only worn for a few months? Musing on this kept her occupied for a couple of minutes, before she decided that angst wasn't her thing, and she really ought to get on with her life. So she'd get up, Realise how chilly it was, pull her robe on and go down to the kitchen. The house was always a little too cold, regardless of the season of year or the time of day. So when she'd prepared breakfast, she'd lay the pot and plates on the tray with the hay wen on it and take it outside into the sunshine. The next half hour or so would be spent leisurely munching triangles of wholemeal toast and washing them down with the finest Sumatran coffee. On the second day, she'd pulled an old portable television from one of the guest bedrooms and set it down on the garden table. Locating an extension lead long enough to reach the socket in the kitchen had proved a little more tricky, but there had been one on a workbench in the garage. Most of the time, she kept the sound down, content to glance across every so often at the flickering two-dimensional monochrome images of the world outside her walled garden. First thing in the morning, though, she'd twist the volume control up and listen to the headlines. Today, an Irishman with a square head was sitting on a sofa with a grinning young woman. They were discussing the Prime Minister's visit to Washington, and there was much talk of forging links and common ground. Benny tried a little quiz on herself, but couldn't remember the name of either the Prime Minister or the President. Both countries had had an election in the last nine months, so it was tricky. It wasn't important. She twisted the dial and managed to find another channel amidst the static. Fast news, coming live from the National Space Museum in London. I'm Justin Webb. Today, Tuesday, May the 6th, Britain returns to Mars. It is over 20 years since the first missions to the Red Planet. We'll be asking former Minister of Science, Lord Greyhaven, whether this is the beginning of a new life on the final frontier or just an expensive waste of money. But first... 
Here's Juliet with the headlines. The picture switched to another chirpy blonde. Good morning. The headlines today. At a speech from the White House lawn, uh, the Prime Minister has... Benny turned the television off. A little aurora danced on the screen for a couple of seconds as the tube cooled down. It was eight o'clock, time to check the post. She stood and made her way down to the lawn. In her bare feet, walking down the gravel driveway was out of the question. Cutting across the garden was also a shorter route. She stepped across the lawn, the long grass still wet with dew. She made her way past the fountain, a piece of Victoriana that, like the tall greenhouse at the side of the house, had fallen into disrepair at some point over the last century. Rainwater had collected, and yesterday she'd seen tadpoles swimming about in there. There was no sign of them today. Benny carried on walking past the tulips, through the shrubbery and towards the gate. Every so often she'd look back at the house, hoping to see the TARDIS arrive. The statue of the girl was still by the gates, hidden among the Leylandia. It was life-size and dull grey, the colour of concrete. The subject was fifteen at most, with hair that fell down her back. She wore a miniskirt and cropped jacket. One of her high heels was missing. Her face was set forever in an expression of terror. Her arms were held out in front of her, as if she was trying to keep something away. Benny didn't know which thought was more disturbing that the doctor had chosen to put the figure in his garden for aesthetic reasons, or that it hadn't always been a statue. She certainly had no intention of asking him about it. Um, Benny reached the iron gates and checked the post box. The first thing she found was the mirror, which she still hadn't got around to cancelling. Issuing both the state visit to Washington and the Mars landing, the front page had decided instead to reveal that a voluptuous young woman pictured in a white bask and stockings, was having sex with someone famous that Benny had never heard of. This, the headline declared, was a world exclusive. A quick flick through the paper revealed that many other people were doing much the same. A couple of years ago, Benny would have tutted at the demeaning and trivial nature of the stories. Now she just felt the faint ache of jealousy the belief that all the young people were off somewhere else having more fun than her. Behind the paper, there was a single letter. Benny frowned when she saw it. The envelope was dull grey. It was the type used for official communications in her native 26th century. Before she picked it up, she checked around, but there was no sign of who had delivered it. There wasn't a stamp. There wasn't a postmark. There wasn't a corporate or military logo. The only thing printed on it was her name, Professor Bernice Surprise Kane Summerfield. She looked at it for a moment. Thirty-nine characters, not including the hyphen. Opening the envelope, and was rather shocked to find that it offered her the chair of archaeology at St. Oscar's University on the planet Della. There was a reasonable wage, a rather generous research grant, and free board and accommodation. The vice-chancellor looked forward to meeting someone of her repute, Benny read the letter again to make sure she wasn't missing some vital point, or perhaps the punchline. She had been given to understand that to get that sort of job, one had to apply for it. The date on the letter was March 2593, almost a quarter of a century after her own time. Somewhat preoccupied, she tucked the letter and the newspaper underneath her arm and set off. The journey back up to the house always seemed to take longer than the trip down. As it sat on the green grass below the clear blue sky, the house looked like a natural feature rather than anything man-made. Simultaneously, it looked well tended and half in ruin. It seemed quite small from the gates, but inside it was a labyrinth of empty bedrooms and dusty storerooms. She'd been dropping in for years, but Benny still couldn't think of the place as a home. The house had stood for centuries, but no one had ever lived there for more than a couple of weeks at a time. It had compensated, filled its rooms and landings with the creak of floorboards and the rattling of pipes. Lying awake in the middle of the night, something she did every so often, Benny always got the impression that there were other people staying in the house. Not ghosts or burglars, nice people. By the time she returned to the house... Benny concluded that the doctor wasn't turn up for at least another day and had reconciled herself to another day of dozing in the sun. 
Perhaps later she'd try her hand at sketching. The orchard, about a hundred yards to the west, looked like a good prospect. Recent storms had brought down a couple of the trees and made the woodland look terribly dramatic. There was a tin of pencils and a drawing pad in the living room. It would give her some more time to think about the letter from Della. When she stepped back onto the flagstones, Benny realised how dirty her feet had become. She put the mirror down on the garden table, propping it underneath the breakfast tray to stop it blowing away. Then she stepped inside to take a quick shower. The house was vast, but there was only one bathroom, which had been the cause of friction between the doctor's travelling companions on more than one occasion. She remembered the last time Roz had stood at the bathroom door, demanding to know how Chris could possibly take an hour and a half in there every day. Benny and Jason had... <laughs> they had both been woken by the sound of raised voices. They lay curled around each other in the upstairs bedroom, able to listen only to Roz's side of the argument, trying to stop each other giggling, but both their bodies convulsed with laughter at every terse insult that drifted up the short flight of stairs. They'd been pressed so close together that in the end they hadn't been able to distinguish which of them was laughing at which remark. They'd had to part, exhausted, and for the rest of the day, every time they made eye contact, they couldn't help sniggering. And he found herself smiling even now, despite all that had happened since. Another source of tension was the minuscule amount of hot water the house would allow every day. It was possible to get more, Benny had discovered, although you had to slap the brass tank that sat on the landing a couple of times to get it. When you heard the glup deep below in the bowels of the house, you'd know that you'd done it. It was the sort of valuable, trivial information that you kept from your housemates, and she'd not told anyone else about the trick. The brass piping, like the electrical wiring, was a little haphazard. Knowing the house's owner, Benny could well imagine how the plumbing had been installed a bit at a time over the centuries, on the basis of need, from junk the doctor had found in the garage. She reached the landing with this bathroom on it. A quick check of the tank revealed that it was just about full. Benny stepped into the bathroom, leaving the door open, because she could. <laughs> Experience had taught her to run the shower for a minute or so before stepping into it. So she stood on the cold, black tiles, waiting for the rattling pipes to catch up with her. Hot water soon began gushing out. She slipped out of her robe and into the shower stall. After getting used to the temperature, she leant against the tiled wall, trying to prop herself upright while she soaped her foot. By the time she had the other one clean, Benny had decided to wash her hair. She stood for a moment, facing out onto the landing, letting the water splash across her shoulder blades and run down her back. Without needing to look, she bent down and reached back until her hand located the tiny phial of herbal shampoo slotted into the shower rack. Benny unscrewed the top and massaged it into her scalp, working it up into a lather. Foamy bubbles ran down her neck and splattered to the floor of the shower unit. The peace of the morning outside was disturbed by an unearthly wheezing, groaning sound that drifted through the half-open bathroom window. Isn't it always the way? Benny observed, ducking her head under the water to get the worst of the suds off. You couldn't even rely on the doctor to be unreliable. She twisted the shower off and scooped up her robe from the bathroom floor, pulling it around herself as she bounded down the stairs. Through the kitchen window it was possible to glimpse a solid blue shape outside on the patio, right by the garden table. Benny hurried out through the kitchen door, leaving a trail of wet footprints. The TARDIS stood there, as if it had never gone away. The light on the top was still flashing, and the grounds of the house were echoing with the sound of its arrival. Benny stood looking up at it for a couple of seconds, soapy water dripping from her fringe. The door opened. Sorry I'm late, you wouldn't believe the state of the traffic around the Horsehead Nebula. The man who was framed in the doorway looked about her age. In his mid-thirties, perhaps a little bit older. He was about her height. He wore a velvet frock coat that was probably a very dark green, but which might have been a plain chocolate brown. Either way, he came down to his knees, and underneath it was a wing-collar shirt complete with grey cravat and a shiny, patterned waistcoat. 
He was wearing baggy trousers, tan ones that had never even considered the idea of having a seam. His long face was angular, with a jutting chin and aristocratic nose. But it was softened by a mass of dark brown hair that swept back down all the way from his high forehead to his broad shoulders. He had a full mouth and sad blue eyes. Doctor? she asked, unsure why. Bernichel? He jumped forward, a broad, open-mouthed grin on his face, and tried to hug her. Benny took a step back, almost tripping over one of the garden chairs. The stranger pulled himself back. What's the matter? he asked. His voice had a hint of the doctor's Celtic lilt, but only a trace. What do you mean, what's the matter? What do you think? The man paused, stroking his top lip as he considered the question. I've changed my appearance since we last met, he concluded with a faraway look on his face. Well spotted, you've also started to go in for hugging. You know I don't like that. He fixed her with those eyes of his. We were alone in your tent on a planet called Heaven. The hooty had been destroyed. You were packing, ready to leave. There was a Japanese fan in your hand. I asked if we could be friends and put my hand on your shoulder. You asked me not to touch you. You said that I was very tactile, but you weren't and that you'd prefer it if I didn't. The doctor put a hand on Benny's shoulder. I am the doctor, Benice, your friend. She hugged him. You're wet, he whispered softly. I was in the shower. Where's Chris? Oh, Gallifrey. He stayed behind, but he said he might pop around to see you. A lot has happened to me since then. Benny yawned. It's been pretty damn action-packed here, too, I can tell you. I'll get dressed and tell you about it. The helicopter maintained a steady 230 kph at 1750 meters altitude. From the ground it was a tiny black dot, making its way silently across the clear blue sky. Inside, the guards didn't know who their prisoner was, not for certain. But they knew that he was a convicted multiple murderer and that he was to be considered dangerous at all times. They had been briefed about that before they had left and given orders to shoot him if he even looked like he was trying to escape. There were four guards in all. The prisoner was handcuffed to one guard, with another armed man opposite. The prisoner wore dark blue coveralls, a uniform without pockets, belts or buttons, fastened by a single strip of Velcro down the front. They'd searched him twice, once in his cell and again at the helipad. The prisoner wasn't allowed to speak, but the noise of the rotor blades and the engines would have drowned out anything he said anyway. Everyone in the helicopter was wearing bright orange ear protectors. Not a word had been spoken since the start of the flight over an hour ago. The prisoner was in his early fifties and was still in good shape. He had the square jaw and bearing of a military office. His face was striking with a chiselled profile and distinctive eyebrows that darted up over his temple. It was one of those faces you were sure you'd seen before, in a colour supplement, perhaps, or on television. He sat in his harness, looking around with a keenness entirely lacking in his wardens. Only Caldwell, the man in charge of the transfer operation, knew who the prisoner was. In his day, Alexander Christian had been notorious, but that day had long gone. The tabloids had plenty of other killers to vilify, and they'd forgotten about him in favour of the Yorkshire Ripper, Myra Hindley and Rosemary West. Every so often, stories would leak out about the activities of those three, sparking off another little flurry of public interest. It had been twenty years since Alexander Christian had made the headlines, back when the men that were guarding them today were still at nursery school. Caldwell wondered if they'd even heard of him. I hope you enjoyed that. If you want to hear the full chapter, sign up. Sign up right now to my Substack uh, uh, and you'll get it. And in subsequent weeks, we're going to get a ton more. Go ahead and sign up. Yeah.